ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وانعم واكرم وبارك على حبيبنا وشفيعنا وملاذنا وقرة عيوننا محمد صلوات ربي وسلامه عليه يقول عز من قائل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed day of Jumu'ah to shower us with his grace and his mercy We ask him to send an abundance of prayers and peace upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira Brothers and sisters, in the past weeks, we have started the journey of exploring one of the critical spheres of our masjid, the sphere of ilm, knowledge. We spoke about the virtue of knowledge on a theological level, a spiritual level, and a social level. We spoke about, in the last khutbah, what are some of the critical qualities that we have to have to attain this knowledge? What does it really take to attain knowledge. The question that I wanted to begin considering for this khutbah today, which I think is the question that's been on many people's minds since we began, is what exactly do you mean when you say knowledge? What is this knowledge that we have been referring to? And this question is so absolutely critical because I know if I were to pose this question to this audience here and ask what do you think is knowledge or what do you think is beneficial knowledge, we will have a myriad of answers or responses to that question. If we just take the way we've kind of organized ourselves socially today regarding what beneficial knowledge is, the way our homes kind of operate in this capacity, we will see a very distinct kind of outcome when we perceive it at a macro level. Today, if we look at our universities and we look at what our children, what we push our children to pursue, much of it is attached to some form of financial excellence towards the end, some form of capital growth towards the end. So today, you know, the, the, the disciplines or the knowledge that we pursue is heavily scientific, medical doctors, engineers. We pursue you know, finance, finance and management, things that will allow us to excel in corporations, and so on and so forth. This is not to say that everyone who goes into all of these disciplines only wants money, but when we take a step back and we assess it at a macro level, we will see that finances, that the dollar is really driving what we perceived to be beneficial knowledge today. So if I want my child to pursue a particular discipline, I know that I'm going to push them to become one of these things. Not only am I going to push them in that direction, I'm going to exhaust myself to ensure that they are attaining excellence. So if I want my son or my daughter to become a pharmacist, I'm going to push them to go to the best schools. And I'm gonna spend a lot of money in that regard. I'm gonna make sure they're prepared for all of the necessary entry exams. And if they don't do well, I'm gonna discipline them. And if they're not studying enough, I'm gonna push them harder. Because we know the outcome is what? My son or my daughter is gonna have a good job. They're gonna make good money. And socially, it's a viable thing to say, like my daughter or my son, they have this type of expertise. And I know, that all of us here recognize that as Muslims who believe in Allah, that is simply not enough. We know for a fact that that is not the highest form of intellectual pursuit. And so the question is, how do we approach this idea of knowledge in this world? And to do this, I want us to think of one of the greatest intellectual minds in the Muslim tradition. Someone who is known as Hujjatul Islam, the proof of Islam, Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. For those of you who don't know him, you should definitely come to learn about him. 
but he is someone that until today, and he, was, he died in the early 6th century Hijri calendar, he is someone until today who is widely revered in the circles of Islamic learning. So you go to any of the major institutions such as Azhar and otherwise, and you will see his books and all of the different disciplines being studied thoroughly. His, mention, his name is always being mentioned. You go to Western academic institutions and you will find the name of Al-Ghazali always mentioned, always theorized. He was a polymath. He was someone who had intellectual expertise in so many disciplines. When in, during his time, he was placed as the chair of Al-Madrasa al, al nidamiyyah which was like the equivalent of all of the Ivy League schools of today combined into one. It was the most honorable chair of learning, of scholarship in the world of the time, and it was in Persia. Imam Abu Ghal Hamid, he held this chair. And so I believe that for us, if we want to understand what really intellectual excellence looks like, what true knowledge looks like, perhaps we go into our scholarship to see what they've said. Because I think we will find something that is remarkably unique. In, in one of his most critical books, Imam Abu Hamil Ghazali writes in Ihya Ulum al Din, the revival of the Islamic uh, of the of the the revival of the Islamic sciences or the religious sciences, he begin, he has an entire chapter called Kitab al Ilm, the book of Ilm, the book of knowledge. And in it he begins to illustrate for us what is knowledge and what is the primary knowledge and what is the secondary knowledge. And what he says there, this great intellectual mind who's respected by all of the major institutes of learning today, he says that the first knowledge that you have to learn as an individual is the obligatory knowledge. What does that mean? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every single Muslim. So what all of us in this room need to understand is that there is knowledge in the world that is of obligatory nature upon each and every single one of us. So Imam Abu Hamid says, that is the most important knowledge that you have to learn first and foremost. That which is fardu ayn, that is obligatory upon each and every single one of us. So he says, in that capacity, number one, you have to make sure that as a servant of Allah, your actions are sound. So Allah has commanded us to pray. Am I praying correctly? Is my prayer, when I stand and make it, is it a valid prayer? Many of us, we've learned prayer just by kind of, you know, um, looking at other people. We examine what other people do. But have I taken the time to really ensure that my salah is valid in the sight of Allah? Do I know what actions or what things I may do in my prayer that perhaps may invalidate it? This knowledge, you don't need to know it on a scholarly level, but we need to know it to ensure that our, our obligations are sound. Imam Abu Hamid talks about tahara, purif purification, ritual purification. Are we sure that when we go to the bathroom and we purify ourselves to prepare for prayer, is that being done correctly? The Prophet Wasallam, one time he was passing by a grave and he heard screams. And he said that one of these screams was a person who did that he was someone who did not correctly purify him or herself from urine. Right? So, when you're in the grave, you're not going to be so concerned about whether or not you were a partner in your firm or you were the chief resident in your hospital. You're going to be concerned, was my wudu correct that ensured that my salah was sound? This is what Imam Abu Hamid is directing us to think about. Because I know that this is a great challenge. When we think about excellence in our world, we think about these lofty goals as CEOs and doctors and lawyers and so on. Imam Abu Hamid says, if this is not sound, then your knowledge is not beneficial. So it begins with salah being sound, your tahara being sound. It begins with your zakah being paid correctly. 
each and every single one of us, if we have the financial means and the, 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 the base necessity, we have to pay zakah. Do we know how to do that correctly? Do we know how to assess what is zakatable and what is not? What from my assets or finances requires zakah or not? It is an obligation upon each and every single one of us to learn that. Once again, not at a scholarly level, but on an individual level for me. If I'm a business owner, it's an obligation for me to learn what it means to conduct my business in a sound fashion. And the list goes on of things that Allah wants to ensure that your conduct is correct. The way you speak, the way you dress, the way you act. All of this is an obligation for us to learn. Not something nice, not something that we may or may not do, or we just follow what our parents did, or we follow what other people in the masjid did. That's not sufficient. We have to go to scholars and teachers to understand and learn this. He also, Imam Abu Hamid talks about from the obligatory knowledge is correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Fa'lam, and Allah in the Quran says, Fa'lam, annahu la ilaha illallah. You are to know. Fa'lam, know that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, it's in the realm of obligatory knowledge. It's a command that Allah is giving us. So do we really understand who Allah is? Do we believe in Him the way He has spoken about Himself? Do we believe in His angels and His books? Do we believe in the grave and the afterlife? Do we believe in the hisab? Do we believe that there is such a thing as qada in qadr, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so the message is very simple. It is an obligation in all of the sea of knowledge that we have out there. It is an obligation for us to pursue these knowledges. And lastly, and I'll close this section with this. He says, that which puts you on the path towards spiritual excellence. That from the obligatory knowledge upon every single person in this room is that we begin to learn what will make my heart sound, to give me qalbun salim, a sound heart, as Allah says in the Quran, right? That I arrive at Allah on the day of judgment and my heart is sound. That requires that I begin to learn about the diseases of the heart. I learn what envy does, what hatred does, what anger does, what arrogance does. I understand the nature of the lower self, the nafs, and how the nafs may push me to worship myself. And the nafs wants to push me to do things that are displeasing to Allah. These are realities, the waswas of the shaitan, the waswas of people. All of these things at a basic level are of obligatory nature for all of us. And so brothers and sisters, the, the solution, the, the, what is required is not that we go home tonight and we learn it all, but that this is of primary concern. Just as I push my child to make sure that they're studying for their, for their pharmacy exam, I'm pushing my child to make sure, first me first, to make sure that they know how to pray correctly. They understand the traps of the shaitan. They understand the disease of the heart. And this requires an investment in this type of learning. So Imam Abu Hamad says, this is first and foremost the most primary type of knowledge that every single Muslim should be concerned with. Secondarily, he talks about the knowledge that is termed as fardu kifaya, which is not an individual obligation upon all of us, but a communal obligation. Meaning that if a part of us do it, then we, the rest of us are saved. And the description that he uses to explain what that communal obligation type of knowledge is, he says, ما يكون به قوام الإنسان في الدنيا That which ensures that the human being in the dunya, their affairs are upright. So he begins to talk about many of the disciplines that we're familiar with. That's where he starts to talk about tib, medicine, that we need in our communities, in our societies, doctors who will give us medicine to help us heal our wounds or heal our ailments or do surgery, etc. This is from the communal obligation because this is what makes the human being upright. And he talks about mathematics and the necessity for people who know how to do proper commerce for business transactions. He speaks about people who know how to do agriculture. 
He speaks about people who know how to engage in, in the political arena, in governance. That governance is a critical communal obligation. We have to learn what proper and, and meaningful governance looks like. And he even speaks about khiyata, <laughs> sewing. That we need people, as a communal obligation, we need people who can put clothing together so that we are covered. And so here he illustrates a broad spectrum of disciplines that we have to learn to ensure that our life in this dunya is meaningful. But another critical sphere that he mentions in this regard that I think is grossly unnoticed in our modern society is philosophical inquiry. And I know this sounds a little bit wishy-washy for some people. What do you mean by that? See, today we live in a day and age where science pervades everything. We live in what is known as the scientific age. So all of our studies, all of our interests, if you kind of dig deep, are relegated to the scientific realm. Engineering, mathematics, etc. Right? That's what the, the, the institutions are modeled after. But what the true genius of Imam Abu Hamil Ghazali was, and the reason why he was able to elevate so high in the intellectual realm during his time, was because he, he mastered he was a master of his texts. He understood the Quran and Sunnah and the way of the ulama. And he embodied all of those and he started to pursue all of those obligatory knowledges. But he also philosophically was very aware. He knew what drove the society that he lived in. He wasn't just operating blindly as a clog in society. This is what society says is good. This is what I do. That was not the excellence of our scholars. What they were, was they were able to elevate far beyond. Because today, what we don't pay attention to as a community is that our modern world, as it is today, is a product of philosophies and isms of the past 200 years. That there are realities in our history that have played out to construct our modern world. It didn't come out of nowhere. You know, if you just look at the families and look at, his, look at individuals and families today, today we, we have this idea called individualism. This idea that the society revolves around the individual. Did no one ever stop and think why that's the case? You know, for centuries the world operated through the, the lens of the family. We had a familial disposition to society. That was the, cent the case for centuries throughout the world. But today in the modern world, the individual is the most important thing. The individual is a Rabb. The individual is a Lord in the modern world. Why is that the case? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Unfortunately, as a Muslim community, we haven't developed the excellence to think an, at this level to understand that, hold on, maybe this is not necessarily a good thing. That today, that today science... Science has always been and always will be a tool to explore the physical world. I want to understand something in biology, chemistry. I have this tool called science. But today we have something very different. We have something called scientism, where science now is a religion. No longer just a simple tool in the realm of the physical, but now science is a religion that explains life. And so one of the travesties in this regard, and many Muslims fall in this, is that if I hear something from the religion, and then it doesn't settle well with my scientific mind, I reject it. And that is the case all too often. Many of the radical atheists that we hear in the media today, they, they worship science. It's not just a tool. It's a religion. And so if it, if it contradicts something to them, it's very easy to reject. And unfortunately, that's trickling into the Muslim community, right? That we don't realize that science is just a tool and that there is much more to explain the metaphysical, right? The metaphysical world realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of angels and so on. This is far beyond the scientific exploration. And so how is it even going to begin to answer these questions? It doesn't have the capacity. But many of us have fallen prey in this regard. And these are just two simple examples of some of the dominant philosophical forces of our day. 
And so what Imam Abu Hamid did that was of such genius, and if you don't have this book, buy this book, The Deliverance from Error, Al-Munqidh Min Al-Dalal. In that book, he shows his capacity to absorb the world as it was. He understood all of the major philosophies of his world. And then he was able to give a, a thorough analysis from the Islamic perspective. Because he was a master of both the textual knowledge and the contextual knowledge. He knew both very well. And so brothers and sisters, as Muslims living in America, we have to understand what it's going to really take to thrive in our modern world. We have to understand it's going to go back to a commitment to learning our religion thoroughly the way that Imam Abu Hamid did and simultaneously truly understanding the context of the world that we live in and not just submitting to it as some sort of standard. You know, blindly we operate under this idea, well, the world has today arrived to the best possible point. That we today as a civilization, we are at our best possible point. And I think we can all very easily say that's simply not the case. There's a lot that the world needs to do better to be a better place. And so when we as a, as a Muslim community, when we commit ourselves to this paradigm of knowledge, that first and foremost we learn that which is of obligatory nature from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we really have an intimate relationship with our sources. And then we understand the need to socially and civilizationally understand our context. And yes, become experts in science and mathematics and medicine, but to also become experts in the realm of philosophy and sociology and anthropology and all of these critical humanities disciplines. You know, one of our great thinkers of the past is Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun is known today as the father of, 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 of modern sociology and histography. One of our great ulama. And it was his capacity to really begin to dissect society that gave him that level of excellence. And so brothers and sisters, to answer the question that we began in the beginning, the knowledge that we need is in this paradigm. It is the knowledge of what is of obligatory nature and then what allows us to thrive contextually. But all of this, all of this, by the way, all of it, is not important or is null and void if it's not done with the sole pursuit of attaining Allah's pleasure. Our scholars would say, شَغَلَتْنَا الْأَدِلَّةَ عَنِ الْمَدْلُولِ that when you live in this dunya, one of the biggest threats is that you get so caught up in the proofs, in the adilla of this world, whether text or context, and we forget about the madlul. We forget about what all of these proofs are pointing towards, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so our ultimate goal, through all of our learning, regardless of what it is, is to attain Allah's pleasure. If that is not the primary pursuit for why we do what we do, regardless of our careers, then what we're doing is not meaningful. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us and gift us beneficial knowledge. May he grant us the knowledge that makes him pleased with us. May he grant us the knowledge that will allow us to thrive in this life and the next. We ask you, Ya Allah, Ya Kareem, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, to guide us to that which is pleasing to you, to allow us to follow in the footsteps of our beloved Messenger Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wa Akhiru Da'wana, and Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa Nasta'inuhu wa Nasta'gfiruhu. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد Brothers and sisters, I want to close with this. As we are continuing to explore this idea of knowledge and beneficial knowledge, and knowledge that will allow us to thrive, and we're, we're slowly digging deeper into our intellectual heritage, and we're learning what the ulama of our past did, and why we had such excellence 
at certain points in our history, whether it was in Baghdad or in Spain. Right, to see the great thinkers of Ar-Razi and Al-Fakharani and all of these great minds, Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Rushd and Imam Abu Hamad and Imam al-Juwayni, and to see that they were the maqsad, they were the ones across the world, Muslims and non-Muslims, they sought these individuals for learning and growth. I want us to think about that as we think about our own journeys as Muslims in America. Because many times, what tends to happen as Muslims in America, we think that America is this set thing that we just have to kind of absorb into. And the reality is that America is a work in project. It's a work in progress. America is an ongoing project. America is not one solid thing. It's an amalgamation of peoples and histories and cultures and philosophies since the time of its inception. And so what we have to understand as Muslims is that we have a lot to offer to the American mosaic. There is a lot that we can offer in terms of our virtues and our values and our principles and our ideals and our intellectual and spiritual heritage that can make America great. We have in our tradition that. And we have to understand that that is an addition that will be ibnillah, beautify the world that we live in. Never think for a moment that your values or your virtues are something that you should run away from. Something that you should take off and, and get rid of. Something that you should hide because some th person or people don't or won't like it. No. America is an ongoing project. And it's something that we have a lot to add to. And we say this as Americans, as people who are either born here or who came here as immigrants. And we're all ultimately immigrants in this country. But the fact of the matter is that the Islamic intellectual heritage has so much to offer. But we have to be collectively committed to going back and learning this tradition. Learning about the spiritual excellence of our ulama the intellectual excellence of our ulama and the civilizational excellence of our ulama. And I hope and pray that we can collectively be committed. And I hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can use us to better the country that we live in. That regardless of where Muslims may live, whether it is in the US or Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Burma, may Allah protect our brothers and sisters in Burma or any place in the world, that when Muslims are there, they are part and parcel of the excellence of that region. That's what Islam does. Islam transforms to the better always because it is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah renew our commitment to the way of our ulama and our salihin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gift us the knowledge that will make us, make us truly excellent in our lives in our homes. May he bring excellence to our homes. May he give beneficial knowledge to our children and our parents and our cousins and our families. May he guide us all to this truth, the truth of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with us, to unify the hearts of this community, to rid this community of ailments and diseases. We ask you, Allah, to have mercy upon the deceased. We ask you, Allah, to guide us to follow in the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Ya Allah, we ask you to allow us the grace and the honor of following in the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask you, Ya Allah, to make the Qur'an the light of our hearts. We ask you to make the Qur'an the light of our hearts in this life and the next. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give us knowledge of yourself, the most the most laudable and honorable knowledge, Ya Allah, the knowledge of you, the knowledge that you have created us to attain. I have not created the jinn and the humans except to worship Allah, which is to know Allah. May Allah grant us that knowledge. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma hdina fi man hadayt. Wa afina fi man afayt. Wa tawallana fi man tawallayt. Wa barik allahumma lana fi ma aatayt. Wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. Innaka taqdi bil haqqi wa la yuqda alayk. Allahumma ya wasila al munqatiina awsilna ilayk. Allahumma hablana amalan salihan mutakabbalan yukaribuna ilayk. Allahumma sturna fawqal ardi wa tahta al ardi wa yawmil ardi alayk. 
تكن لنا ولا تكن علينا أعنا ولا تعن علينا اللهم بارك لنا في أقوالنا وفي أفعالنا وفي أولادنا وفي أسرنا يا الله يا كريم يا رحمن يا رحيم وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين